What about something like this? Non-interference, property, dispute resolution, impartiality. A rule of non-interference is one that maximizes autonomy. As we alluded to before, I won't interfere with you if you don't interfere with me. We might also call these individual rights, or rights to non-harm. A rule of personal property is a precondition of trade. Unless yours is yours and mine is mine, we have no basis upon which to make exchanges. Ownership also gives us incentives to protect and conserve resources. A rule of dispute resolution ensures that impartial third parties settle conflicts between people. Conflict is costly and works against the interests of peace, so an independent judiciary is vital to any social order. A rule of impartiality means that the rule of law is in place and that the law privileges no person or group over another. Sometimes we call this equality before the law. These are pretty simple, and they should be. Complex orders arise from simple rules. Now that we've covered the kinds of rules required for social systems to function well, let's move on to a vital form of interaction. Transaction, or trade. Transaction is nothing more than exchange of values between two willing parties. The values they exchange are determined by the parties involved. You determine what is valuable to you and no one else. In that way, they are subjective, that is, belonging to the person. In other words, if value is not objective, transaction is in a very important sense based on personal choice. Trade is a positive sum activity. Each party is better off after an exchange, they mutually benefit, as opposed to zero sum where only one party benefits at another's expense. Some people think that if someone gets richer, it means that someone else gets poorer, that wealth is like a fixed pie, but wealth increases when people trade. Markets are simply groups of people expressing preferences and exchanging values. Nothing more, nothing less. Free markets are people trading without harm, that is, force, theft, fraud, or interference. Institutional rules, properly enforced, protect free markets because they protect people from harm. And while many people blame free markets for social problems and other types of harm, by definition, a trade that results in harm is not free. Three additional points we can note about the process of transaction. First, people are very likely to change their behavior if they'll benefit from doing so, which is to say, incentives matter. Second, there's no such thing as a free lunch. This is another way of saying that resources are scarce, or in limited supply. No matter how one may try to mask the costs of a resource, the full costs are always paid somewhere, by someone. Third, free and open markets offer the best hope for people to respond in a rational way to scarcity. That's why, paradoxically, markets create prosperity. You know from Economics 101, when something is in short supply, it becomes more expensive, which discourages people from consuming that thing. When fewer people consume something, it is conserved for later consumption. In this way, trade becomes a process by which wealth is simultaneously created and resources are conserved. Let's turn now to specialization. Specialization is the process by which we focus our productive resources toward creating the highest value. The process of specialization involves three basic ideas, entrepreneurship, the division of labor, and gains from trade. Division of labor means introducing efficient ways of producing things people value by separating and localizing discrete tasks. In the case of goods, this might be a manufacturing process. In the case of services, this might be dividing up the work a team does in order more efficiently to deliver a service of higher quality. Gains from trade, also known as a law of comparative advantage, is a process by which everyone benefits from exchanging values, even when some party is relatively less productive when compared with another party. Let's pause for a moment to linger on gains from trade, because the concept, while vital, can be elusive. Taking a simple example from an old story about Winston Churchill, we can illustrate gains from trade. 
It is said that Winston Churchill was a fantastic bricklayer. He learned masonry as a young man. But when it came time for the elder Churchill to build a wall around his garden, he hired a bricklayer instead of doing it himself. Why? Because Churchill was a better prime minister than he was a bricklayer, so it was best that he devoted his time and resources to being an effective leader. To distill this idea further, comparative advantage is about recognizing the opportunity costs of not doing some activity one is uniquely good at. If I do X, I can't do something more specialized. Also, trade is beneficial for both parties even if one party is less productive at an activity. Finally, Comparative advantage applies to trade between individuals or between whole countries. All right. If institutions supply the rules that regularize activity and lower transaction costs, transactions begin among people exchanging values, and specialization allows people better to concentrate their productive efforts, then what animates the system? Information. But in any complex system, there is way too much information for any one person or group of people to reckon with. This is known as the knowledge problem. Spontaneous order, society, we said, is too complex to be known by a single mind. Knowledge, or information, is dispersed. Values are varied, which means they can differ radically from one person to another. So, how are resources efficiently to be allocated? Through the price system, of course. Among the institutions we mentioned above, we might add that prices should be determined freely by actors in the marketplace. But pricing is not arbitrary. Free pricing ensures that there are distributed information signals about scarce goods and services. People may then make decisions about this information without any central authority. The supply of something, measured against its demand, leads to a reasonable market price. Such price signals are a way complex economies function without central planning. What if we deviate from the price system? What happens when central bureaucracies allocate resources or set prices? Unintended consequences can occur. Negative results we didn't plan for crop up. Shortages and surpluses. Producers have too much or too little of things people need. Other market distortions. Competition is stifled, or people overconsume. Regression to hierarchy. Bureaucracies try to plan the economy. Interference by the state in our lives. Bureaucracies tell people what to do. Before concluding, let's try to recap all that we've learned so far. Systems, as they grow more complex, tend away from hierarchies and toward networks. Market societies are complex spontaneous orders, or networked orders. Spontaneous orders arise from processes of transaction and specialization, which are governed by simple institutional rules. The complexity of our society means knowledge and information is dispersed. But a system of prices provides the best indicator of other people's preferences, as well as the scarcity of resources. Finally, if we take all that we've learned and try to distill it into some useful rules of thumb, we might arrive at the five I's. First, institutions matter. Add the simple rule of simpler rules, and you have the core of a prosperous society of free people. Two, implement subsidiarity. That is to say, where possible, go local. Three, incentives matter. Incentives can be positive or perverse, but they can change people's behavior. 4. Individuals matter. Societies should respect individuals' rights to person and property. 5. Information matters. Free prices allow markets to be more efficient and to self-correct. This completes our first presentation on complexity in economics. Thanks for listening.